Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished guests. Uh, my name is Defne Arslan. I'm Senior Director of the Atlantic Council in Turkey and Turkey Prog Program Center uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all today alongside my friend and colleague Harry Smitras from the Peace Research Institute of Oslo for discussion on cooperation in the East Med region. And with this occasion, I also like to thank Nicolas Krikades, executive president and planning member of the Cyprus Forum. So very quickly, we have one hour. So uh, as a brief introduction, uh, the East Med is becoming an increasingly, increasingly strategically important region. Long-standing rivalries and tension in the East Med have grown over the past decade in the part to competition over newly discovered energy deposits, which countries around the region have raised to exploit. The offshore gas resources offer the region a lot of promise, but in many cases have also highlighted tensions by raising the stakes. Uh, so uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine also brought another story to the region, resulting energy, energy crunch has uh, an increased uh, the you know imperative for countries around the region to cooperate in an inclusive manner to utilize rather than waste the resources. Such an approach can help usher in a new level of regional stability and unlock the region's potential, not just in energy, but also trade and investment. There is more to gain as countries cooperate than to compete, especially for the people of the region. Uh, through a focus on win-win opportunities and confidence building measures, the region can capitalize on the recent progress made in relations. Again, while thanking the Cyprus Forum, again, once more giving this platform to discuss this regional cooperation today here with all of you, which I believe is will be key for unlocking regions opportunity and helping ensure greater stability and prosperity and integration. I would like to pass the floor to my colleague Harry, you know, just for uh, his intro remarks, and uh, he will be also introducing our, you know, distinguished speakers, uh, which we will be discussing all these matters today with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Defne. A warm welcome on my behalf. I'm Harry Zimitros, I'm the director of the uh, Peace Research Institute um, Oslo here in Cyprus. And we thought with, um, we pair with Atlantic Council because um, the politics, the geopolitics and, and the energy are of course inextricably interconnected in particular in, in this region, thinking that energy has the capacity, as, as Defne was saying, to either exacerbate existing conflicts or um, act as a catalyst for the solution of them. But this all requires vision and leadership. And this is exactly what we are here to discuss, to have some constructing thinking on, on how engagement through the leadership of the literal countries, but also good countries, good third countries like, like the US can help in this respect. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing the panelists to my immediate right, um, Dr. Um, Charles Elinas, known to Cypriots um, fairly well. Um, Dr. Elinas is the CEO of EC, Cyprus Natural Hydrocarbon Company. Um, he's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council, formerly the head of the Cyprus National Hydrocarbons Corporation. Um, further to the right, uh, Dr. Yanis Basias. Um, Yanis is now an energy um, independent energy consultant, it says, but importantly, he was the former chairman and CEO of the Hellenic Hydrocarbon Resources Management, HHRM. Um, next is Ipek Borman, who's the Secretary General of Global Policy Center and a very well known figure in the North, having served also in the negotiating teams. And um, Mehmet Ochu, who I'm not quite sure needs introductions globally, uh, but um, but uh, Mehmet, among other things, is the chairman of the Global Resource Partnership and the chairman of the London Energy Club, known on, I don't want to say only two sides of the Atlantic, because uh, he's, he's um, extremely active in, uh, in the Far East and China. Um, with that, I'll pass it to, uh, to Daphne. The, the logic is to have introductory statements, short introductory statements, and then two rounds of uh, questions to our speakers. Daphne? I would like to give the floor to first Dr. Charles Elinas, you know, for his brief introductory remarks. Charles. 
floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Harry. Um, I, only, I will only say a few things, but um, since last year, Lebanon and Israel were signed with the help of the Americans, we've seen a number of uh, positive developments. Positive developments, and there are positive things. So we have the Lebanon Israel is the, develop, the drilling of a gas field for Kana, and if it's successful, it will be a, a major development for uh, Lebanon. We also had um, the uh, the that uh, the development of this gas field can progress under certain uh, controls. And if it works out again, it, it, it will be a turning point for the Palestinian state. We approval by Israel to increase gas exports to Egypt by from 8 BCM per million cubic meters per year to tw over 20. And this is in response to Egypt's dire energy situation to ensure the political stability of the country. It's not just a commercial thing, it has huge political implications. And then now, now we have rapprochement between Greece and Turkey, starting with a likely agreement to deal with climate change and natural disasters. Positive, and all indication is that this, this will, will, uh, will proceed. And we also had a thought between Erdogan and Netanyahu, with the, lat the latter Netanyahu offering to export gas to Turkey. That's uh, not going to happen. It's, it's not likely to happen. But nevertheless, it's a political gesture. And uh, it's getting close uh, um, Israel and uh, uh, Turkey back together. There are still challenges to overcome, such as the development of Cyprus gas fields and the resolution of maritime disputes between Greece and Turkey, which are parking at the moment, but they're still there in the background. And for me, the most positive development will be Greece and Turkey working together to resolve their differences that not long ago, these countries will, uh, almost came to war. And, and much depends on the December meetings between these two countries. A reactivation of the Greece-Turkey agreements on immigration will be a good start. It will create a positive atmosphere. And that's what we, we want to talk about, the positive aspects. Um, but lately, the in the background is the perennial Cyprus problem. Complete failure at the, UN, at the UN earlier this month does not bode well. But we heard today uh, the, uh, the um, UN representative Stewart being very positive about it. So who knows? Let's see what happens. Uh, the now likely development of the Aphrodite gas field may bring back problems. It, it is, I believe, that. Uh, by the deadline, which is the 5th of November, Cyprus and Chevron will agree a formula to develop Aphrodite. Once that becomes official, what will be the response of Turkey, Cyprus, and Turkey? I don't know. Hydrocarbons are still central to short and medium term developments with both positive and negative aspects. But there is a, a time element to this. While hydrocarbons in this met uh, have a life, Globally, the life of hydrocarbons has a good part to go. And if we don't manage to get our act together and do something within the next few years, climate change will overtake us and we'll be unable to make any use of this gas. So that's a risk. Uh, the, the future in this matter, I believe, in globally is clean energy. And certainly, the, um, it, it, the Greece and Turkey appear to be starting their cooperation based on climate change, creating a new regional forum with green energy at its core, or renaming this Met Gas Forum to an East Met Energy Forum, would be a good start towards uh, inclusivity and cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Charles, actually, you also answered my question. 
So, uh, <laughs> uh, because I was going to ask you how, uh, you know, just these ESMED pro projects uh, will encourage in the ESMED uh, to cooperate between cooperation between countries. And you actually, you know, gave a very detailed brief description. So, uh, Harry, if I may, can I pass on to our next speaker uh, for, yeah, uh, and we will come back to the questions, you know, just to you. Uh, so, uh, with that, I'd like to turn to uh, Yanis and uh, for his really brief, uh, Please. yes, uh, very brief, uh, you know, introduction. And uh, and uh, my first question, and I can maybe I can also, you know, underline that, uh, that will be for you, you know, what is Greece's position and energy outlook for the region and its vision for the foreseeable future? This will be my question to you, follow up, you know, following your very brief introduction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, let me give you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it works. Yeah. Let me give you my, my thoughts. Uh, uh, probably you will consider that uh, definitely as uh, conclusions, but uh, that's the way I can see it, I think, now. Um, so um, we, uh, I think that uh, uh, we, uh, Looking at the tree and not the forest, the tree is hydrocarbons, and there is a lot of discussion about that. And uh, we're talking about energy transition, but I think the transition is economic, and uh, the energy mix uh, uh, changes all the time and depends from the economical evolution, geopolitics, and how all of these changes will influence uh, the uh, portions of gas, the portions of uh, oil, the portions of uh, coal, the portions of uh, hydro or, or renewables. So uh, this is one of the first conclusions I have, and I prefer to give that now straight because, uh, I mean, my thoughts and my understanding, uh, even on what is going on in Greece uh, and in the Southeast Mediterranean, has to do a lot with uh, these kind of conclusions. And um, uh, so, um, yeah, for Greece, you know, in the last eight years, there was uh, a lot of uh, a lot of focus on the uh, renewables because there was a lot of money coming from uh, the European Union. And, and so uh, uh, Greece abandoned completely the lignite and uh, uh, nobody wanted to uh, talk about the hydrocarbons, although there were some actions. Uh, uh, and this is what I did for, uh, for a few years. But uh, unfortunately, we did not succeed to go further on south of Crete, east of Crete. And um, um, so uh, only because of the pandemic and because of the, uh, uh, because of the, uh, the war, um, uh, everybody, after the permissions, I would say, that the European Union gave to each country, they decided to come back on the game and say, even in Greece, we will search for gas, uh, not oil, something that you cannot understand if you're in the business, because... Uh, uh, oil and gas, they go together all the time. You can find gas, but you will have some oil, or you can find oil and you will have some gas, and then you have to treat that. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, here we are now. I hope that uh, we will continue uh, south of Crete. There will be some, uh, some, uh, um, let's say, uh, some drilling and probably some production. And uh, here we are in this in terms of uh, energy. So uh, I repeat, uh, it is an economic transition, and uh, we have to think on this, even for the Southeast Mediterranean, because that is the way that we will succeed uh, um, a cooperation that everybody is looking for. If we understand that, you have to see what is going on with the BRICS, you know, the R, etc. Eh? Um, uh, so the game is uh, the game is uh, economical. And the energy it is just one part, only one part. That's all for. Uh, I don't know if you're satisfied, but this is what I hope, and this is what I understand from the situation. And Greece also. Uh, Yanis, thank you very much. You know, just, uh, but um, can you maybe if touch base, you know, just uh, also the, uh, you know, just. Greece energy outlook, you know, just for the foreseeable future, you know, just in general, in addition to what you have already said, and uh, and how this may affect the, you know, uh, the area. region area. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, I think uh, if, um, you know, 
today what is going on, and Greece is part of that. Uh, everybody in the Southeast Mediterranean try, uh, is trying to uh, be a hub, a hub for gas, a hub for LNG, for uh, uh, gas regasification, a hub for import to export somewhere else, a hub for uh, uh, electric cables from Africa, uh, simply because uh, uh, Europe is starving uh, about energy. energy. And uh, so Greece is trying to do that. Uh, as uh, Turkey is trying to do that, as Egypt is trying to do that, as uh, Israel is trying to do that. So we have a kind of competition, but uh, the most strong in this competition are these countries they produce. And the countries they produce, uh, it is uh, Egypt and Israel today, I mean, uh, for the offshore gas. And then uh, you have uh, uh, Cyprus, they are trying. And uh, we don't have to forget that uh, Turkey made enormous discoveries in the Black Sea that uh, after going to production, they will help not only to have Turkey as an exporter, a real exporter of gas, but also as someone who will help what will help this uh, northern part of Black Sea to recover after the war. This is very important. So I think that um, uh, because I, I can see the way the way we uh, could discuss about that further, uh, how, what kind of cooperation uh, in energy issues uh, may have uh, uh, Greece and Turkey. I think that uh, if uh, these countries can cooperate so that Greece develops what we have in the Mediterranean, south of Crete and east of Crete, and Turkey develops fast what uh, has uh, in uh, 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 Black Sea, uh, it will be a, a joint contribution enormous to uh, the needs of Europe, because there is a big game that is played with Europe. Uh, they have, uh, they need 500 to 550 BCM per year. And uh, uh, it is not, I mean, with the present discoveries, we cannot do that in the Southeast Mediterranean. Thank you. Uh, we will come back to that when Harry Liner just takes the lead. And uh, from there, if I may, you know, ladies first, Mehmet, I will go with Dr. Ipek Borman. Uh, Ipek, welcome again, you know, just so I will ask you my first question, but please combine with your, you know, first okay. remarks and then we can continue. Uh, President of the, you know, Republic of, of Cyprus who won the recent elections stated that he recognized the responsibility to solve the Cyprus problem and emphasized the need for unity between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots on the island. How do we evaluate the possibility of these new negotiations, or are there any other possible scenarios given the official stances of both sides? And how this can, you know, this a resolution can help with the, you know, just the, all the discussion that we are talking about today? Thank you. I thank you very much. I think it's open. Okay. So, um, th firstly, it's a pleasure to be among such prominent uh, energy experts. Well, I am not one, so I have to state this from the very beginning. So I'll try to, uh, I'll I'll try to present my views uh, from a political uh, point of view. Um, so, uh, well, more than a decade uh, ago, when the first discovery uh, of uh, natural gas uh, of the island of Cyprus had been made, um, we started to seriously talk about the potential of natural gas resources, uh, which we called uh, the hydrocarbons uh, back then, in playing a catalyst role in the solution of the Cyprus problem and uh, unleashing many opportunities in the region and beyond for further cooperation and collaboration. Well, we were politically talking about the potential of those uh, hydrocarbons in transforming the Eastern Mediterranean uh, into a zone of stability and peace. Well, today uh, we are talking from a completely different perspective uh, as the regional and global developments uh, led us to a completely different point where the Eastern Mediterranean has become a very securitized area of competition and conflict where the catalyst has turned into a threat and even brought the sides uh, to 
direct confrontation and where we now consider not the benefit, uh, but mostly the harm of the so-called hydrocarbons as fossil fuels. So uh, over the course of a decade, the structural dynamics of the energy issue in the Eastern Mediterranean and its regional uh, connotations have largely changed. One thing remains intact though, and that is the need for cooperation and collaboration uh, in the region uh, to help prepare the regional actors for forthcoming um, regional and global risks and challenges like that of the climate change. So I, I would like to start with this uh, almost brief introduction and uh, return to your uh, question. So, um, well, I don't know if it's in our political culture or not, uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, one of the biggest problems that we face uh, or which is associated with the politics uh, of Cyprus, uh, and I mean on both sides, uh, is the discrepancy between words and deeds. So um, there are no limits when it comes to promises, uh, but there is too much scarcity and rigidity in realizing those. Uh, promises. So in this respect, I think recognizing one's own responsibility as a leader uh, is very critical uh, as it directly relates to uh, political leadership, uh, political determination, and political will uh, that is embodied. And I think at the moment, uh, what we need is a display of sincere political will on behalf of the leaderships, if any, of course, in initiating a structured and sustained dialogue, direct or even indirect, to be able to walk towards the resumption of a new process. Currently, because the official positions of the two sides are polar opposites, uh, there is no common ground in agreed framework, and the sides even cannot agree on the appointment of a uh, UN envoy who could assess the possibility of bridging the gap uh, to reach to a common ground. Hopefully, yeah, we have every reason to be hopeful uh, that positive developments will take place. But uh, under these circumstances, however most desirable, it seems very like, unlikely uh, that a potential kickstart can come from internally or through internal dynamics. So naturally, this turns our attention uh, to external dynamics that could put pressure on the sites to feel the urgency of a renewed process uh, that could, of course, also deliver results. Um, here, of course, regional actors and developments come to the fore as what we now see simultaneous attempts for renewed cooperation uh, between different regional actors also necessitated by uh, global developments and changes primarily on energy, economy, and commerce. So scenarios uh, relating to these regional attempts are most likely, uh, I think, now to trigger a new process in Cyprus, uh, if there is also political will, uh, of course, on the island to solve the Cyprus problem. Uh, thank you, Ipek and Minujas. Thank you very much. Uh, so from uh, you, I'd like to turn to uh, Mehmet Öykü. Uh, Mehmet, thank you again for being with us today. And uh, I am sure you will be doing some intro remarks, but I will also ask a question uh, to you. Uh, I'd like to, maybe you can touch base a bit on the ISMET forum. Uh, so how does... Uh, you view the effectiveness of ISMET form yourself, and how would it be? How it uh, would it view the potential establishment of more inclusive multilateral organizations, or what will be the best way to do this? You know, I, I know that you have some other ideas which we can also elaborate today here. And while you are here, and also Charles is here, and Yanis is here, so please, thank yes. you. I mean, we had a secret agreement with. Uh, 
I think Harry, he's told me that I can speak about an hour about uh, world geopolitics and then zoom into ISMAT for the following half an hour. And first of all, I would like to thank Cyprus Forum, PRIO and Atlantic Council for bringing stakeholders together because I think in the era where we have so many disputes, controversies, troubles, there is always need for such a platform to encourage dialogue and understand each other's perspectives. I believe that you cannot deal with ISMAT in isolation with what's happening around the world. Our colleague already mentioned about the dynamics in world energy, how it's affecting us. And uh, also geopolitically, there is a considerable shift now. There are new trade routes being created. The last one announced at G20, uh, starting from Mumbai to Dubai, then Riyadh, Amman, uh, Haifa, and uh, uh, to Pire. Uh, this is India, Middle East, and Europe. Then Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, you know about it, 67 countries. Then Arctic route from uh, far eastern part of Russia coming all the way to Baltics. Turkish initiative to Middle, Middle Corridor. Then also Iraqi development route from Basra all the way to Jehan. So what we see is that first geopolitically things are changing. We, it hasn't been settled yet. And, but there are new trade routes, new financing, investment initiatives. In energy, we are stuck in ISMAT only on natural gas matters, whereas the world has moved on. Now we are talking about climate change, green hydrogen, renewables, nuclear, especially middle-sized reactors, and all you have. So also energy efficiency, interconnection, electrical interconnection, and uh, therefore, I think the direct response to your question is ISMAT Natural Gas Forum, I think is not sufficient to cover all these issues. It's not also inclusive. You have France in it, far away country, but you don't have Turkey, the biggest regional power in ISMAT, not only in ISMAT, but all the way from China to Germany, Russia to Saudi Arabia. So if you don't have Turkey in such a platform, it could be a spoiler as well, which it has been. Therefore, I believe that there is a need to create an all-inclusive regional organization grouping. It could be ISMAT energy community, like European energy community for Southeast Europe, in which you will have all the regional countries somehow represented. And also embracing the areas that I mentioned, from energy efficiency to interconnections, the finance and the climate change, and what you have, oil and coal, and but if you look at Turkey, yes, it is quite difficult to read Turkey from outside. On the one hand, sometimes, you know, we are so optimistic, things are changing, as you mentioned, you know, Erdogan speaking to Netanyahu in New York, and he will be coming to Ankara soon, whether this could lead to a tau in relations between Israel and Turkey, paving the ground for perhaps a pipeline from uh, Leviathan all the way to Turkey, then connecting to Europe whether this agreement between Israel and Lebanon about the maritime boundaries, whether it will stick or Hezbollah might spoil it. Then whether we should trust Egypt to become the LNG hub, bringing Cyprus gas there, also Israeli gas, or we have to rely on FSRUs, FLNGs. So there are many questions. I'm so happy that troubles, disagreements are in place so that there is opportunity for us to come and talk all the time. Because when I got into this business of talking about ISMAT, every time we meet, there is a new dynamic. There is a new development which enriches us. But although I'm optimistic and glass is half full in many regards, but I haven't seen anywhere in the world, I've been working on energy matters for ages, energy becoming an instrument for peace. Although we want it to be, you know, if you connect countries with pipelines, that's a commitment for 40 years, 50 years, or LNG agreements for, again, 20 years, 25 years, or interconnectedness. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Look at South China Sea, look at Africa, Middle East. It has become a source of tension and geopolitical competition as well. Therefore, if you bring 
perhaps the private sector more prominently into the picture, it might change a bit. Because if you leave only to diplomats like us or the military strategies, they see everything in terms of geopolitical clout and sovereignty and take or leave. Whereas in business, it's win-win. And therefore, I think one of the questions that you posed in the beginning was whether private sector should be empowered to come in. Because they have the power to influence politicians. Great power, more than that you can imagine. But there are so many actors in the East Mets involved. It's not only countries in the region, from Libya to Syria, which is opening up now. It's going to be another actor that we have to bear in mind, uh, even during the era of Assad. And then Russia is there, although they pushed Novak out of Lebanon now, uh, replaced by Mubadela, I think, uh, by United Arab Emirates. But the Russians are there, Chinese are there, and uh, also you have the Americans, the European Union, then regional countries. Within each country, there are also disputes, troubles. So it is very difficult to manage all this complex relationship. But EU also, I thought, after the sanctions against Russia, and then the Russian gas disappeared from the architecture, uh, the gas supply architecture of European Union, there were high hopes that Europe will push so much effort into EastMed as a new source of gas. And it hasn't happened. We still talk about it, but it's not happening as quickly as we thought it would. So lots of questions and uh, less and less answers. If I don't stop here, I know that you will stop me. You bet. <laughs> so uh, we also have two great speakers who maybe already joined online and uh, so, okay. Um, can can you hear us, Ambassador Harari? Okay. Yes, yes, okay. I do. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Welcome to our session, and uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Ambassador Michael Harari, he is a researcher and task team member, and he was also former Israeli ambassador to Cyprus. Uh, please, you know, just I will just uh, put my question, uh, and please, uh, you are welcome to also give some brief remarks if you are willing to. Uh, Turkey, uh, this is about, of course, Turkey and Israel. They have made significant uh, progress resetting their relationship after many years of tension. Energy cooperation is an important component of this dialogue. Uh, so, uh, I really would like you to comment on this and how do these bilateral relations fit into Israel's uh, existing relations with Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt? Is there a need for, again, as, uh, as a follow-up to what uh, Mehmet had just uh, touched based on, is there a need for a new platform uh, for a more inclusive dialogue? And uh, as I said before, you were former Israeli ambassador to Cyprus, so you have a brief, you know, very detailed knowledge of the region and also the sensitivities and the realities here. And uh, please enlighten us with your experience. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. And I'm really sorry for not being in person with you. It's a real pity, but I will do my best uh, from Israel. Uh, yes, you are right that Israel and Turkey are uh, trying the last year or year plus, let's say, to uh, enhance or to strengthen their relations. I think that we are still in the midst of this process. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has met uh, in New York, as you mentioned, President Erdogan. Most probably he will visit soon uh, 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 Ankara. I think that what both sides are trying to do right now is to explore how can we, let's say, regain uh, trust and confidence that both sides uh, do not have for the time being. And, and I emphasize from both sides, from, from both sides, and I think it's quite important, let's say, to be a little bit, I would say, patient with this process, because this is extremely important. Clearly, when we speak about uh, uh, energy, but many other things as well. The second point, as you mentioned as well with your uh, question, is concerning, of course, our relations, Israel relations with Cyprus, Greece, and, of course, with Egypt. I think what has happened in the last more than a decade, decade that these relations have uh, uh, strengthened enormously, and it covers a lot of cooperation in many fields, political, defense, economy, 
people to people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but more important to that is that those actors, those players, enjoy a lot of confidence and trust between them. I think that for the time being, we can say that there is no substitute from Israel point of view, at least, let's say, to these very important relations. Now, when it comes to what options for energy, let's say, cooperation, I think that Israel is in a position that it has um, decided that it needs one more export route for its natural gas. As you know, Israel is exporting its gas to uh, Egypt and from Egypt wherever to Jordan. But clearly, I think that nowadays it has decided that it needs one more uh, route. We are in our Israel in, in, in this uh, at present at this specific, let's say, position. I think that Israel finds itself, you can dis dis disagree, of course, that in a quite comfortable, let's say, position to explore their, its options. Now, initially, okay, initially there are, I suppose, uh, three options for this new, for, for this one more export uh, route. Uh, as it was mentioned, the, the, the first one is FNG, floating energy. We know all disadvantages and, and advantages of this option. It gives much more room of maneuver. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it is more costly. The second one is a pipeline to Cyprus and from Cyprus by N LNG, let's say Terminal 2, or wherever. Here, the, here there are there are a lot of angles, including, I would say, without elaborating too much, at, at least not now, there is a Turkish angle. And the third one is, as you mentioned, pipeline to Turkey. I think for the time being, what this is exactly what Israel is trying to do, to explore what can be done uh, in these present circumstances. Bear in mind that the East Med, the, uh, I would say the regional architecture in the East Med, the East Med Gas Forum, the, these relations that Israel is having with Greece, Cyprus, and of course with Egypt, that it is very, very important. At least here in, in Jerusalem, there is an understanding that we need to explore what can be done in order to uh, uh, to go ahead. Um, I suppose that at this stage, yes, there is a need for one more, I don't know what how to call it, let's say, one more uh, umbrella or, 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 or a gathering or conference, let's say, in order to include an extremely important actor, which is Turkey. Now, it, 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 it should not be by definition, let's say, as part of the East Med Gas Forum. I don't think so. But it needs to have some kind of loose umbrella in order to enable as constructive as possible, let's say, discussion in this present time. Uh, I think at present, there is a lot of attractiveness to the East Med. Of course, as, as, it, as it was mentioned, because of the war in the Ukraine, because the necessity, let's say, at least for the next few years for, for gas from, from, from the East Med. So the East Med, I think, after the so um, much development, positive development that took place, can afford, let's say, to be honest, and as you mentioned, I'm aware of the sensitivities of many actors in the region, can afford, let's say, to have a wider discussions, which include all actors or re relevant actors, in order to go ahead. Now, I will stop here, and of course, I, if there are more questions later on, I will be very happy to answer. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, thank you very much. You know, I will actually pass the floor uh, to my friend Harry. We also have uh, normally one more speaker, Ambassador Jonathan Cohen. Uh, you know, just Ambassador Cohen is a former colleague of mine from U.S. State Department, and uh, but he was supposed to join, but he couldn't due to technical reasons. But he has his comments. Harry will yeah. uh, read them now uh, on the questions that we were supposed to ask him. Uh, but uh, we are just sending our greetings to him. And I think Harry, you know, just so we started it. I think we may have a bit more time. So uh, I want to, you know, push the limits a bit with your permission, and I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Um, as, um, as, as said, uh, Ambassador Jonathan Cohen, who's now a non-resident uh, senior fellow with the Skoker of Middle East Center um, um, at the Middle East Programs at the Atlantic Council, was supposed to be with us online. There's a glitch online. So he was kind enough to just send me um, 
response to the questions we would have put to him. And these questions would have been, A, how can the U.S. help increase cooperation and partnerships between the Eastern Mediterranean countries? And how would increased cooperation serve the U.S. interests? And also, as we get closer to the second year of the Russian-Ukrainian war, um, we would have asked him how he sees the ongoing war of future impact on the region and what steps should the East Med countries take to prepare for future food and energy crisis. He was kind enough to send me just um, a couple of remarks to say that um, his main ideas were that the U.S. needs an East Med strategy to focus on the region as a distinct entity for cooperation and integration, strengthening and deepening partnerships and developing new ones across trade, tech, energy, education, as well as defense. They should build on a momentum in the Greek-Turkish reconciliation and should leverage the Israeli-Lebanese maritime uh, demarcation and the Greece-Cyprus-Israel-Egypt triangle of cooperation, as well as the MGF. Bodies, says Jonathan, that can deliver integration, AMCHAM, the American um, uh, chambers working together on trade, Fulbright commissions working together to build a regional community of scholars, tourism promotion around the region, and building LNG and renewable links around the region with urgency. And of course, conferences like this one. He also sends us two CBM's ideas for confidence building measures. A joint venture company for gas and renewables led by a Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot with support from Athens and Ankara. A NATO-led search and rescue exercises in the East Med with Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, led by CANCOM and UCOM. So with that, Daphne, if I may, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that we're being pressed for time. We started late and everything is uh, taking a stand. So I'll, I'll revert to the speakers, including uh, Mika, who's online, I think, with um, two very brief questions. One, I'd like each of you to respond as to what keeps you up at night in this matter, and B, what is the slipping pill that you take in the sense of a positive narrative, or um, what can it be that, that makes us less, if you like, um, um, pessimistic in this respect? And I'll start with you, Charles, immediately to my right. As far as the East Med is concerned, and what we do in the region, especially with gas, uh, my, my concern is that we have a dichotomy here. We have the politicians who talk their own language based on politics, purely on politics, bearing no, paying no attention to the commercial aspects, to the desires of the companies. And then, but they don't have any power. They cannot deliver. They can, I mean, Netanyahu can promise a pipeline to Turkey, and he can promise a pipeline to Italy, and a pipeline to Cyprus, but he cannot deliver. And then we have the oil companies that, um, can deliver, have the know-how, have the financial might to uh, deliver uh, projects. And normally they go ahead and try to do their own thing, but we now have a little bit, a little bit of a backlash here in Cyprus. Cyprus is flexing its muscles. It doesn't like what uh, Chevron is proposing. And um, in Israel, there is now a bit of resistance uh, among Israelis about uh, the power of Chevron to make decisions not influenced by the Israeli government. And this is the, this is the dichotomy that worries me, that uh, if we're not careful and we drive it to the limit, we'll get nothing. No, the politicians will get nothing, and the companies will just carry on, uh, or not, not, comp not really walk away, but carry on with other developments. I mean, if you take Chevron, they have billions of dollars of potential developments elsewhere. They don't need to spend too much time here in the, in the region. So this is what we need to bridge, this gap between uh, politicians who uh, a lot of the time, believe me, they talk nonsense, aspiration, political aspirations with no reality in them, and the oil companies who are uh, there to deliver. I think uh, my hope is that um, there is going to be a, bre uh, a, a sort of a agreement between them to proceed before climate change does our way with all of these things. Thank you. So if 
I understand, you give two pills, one to wake up and one to sleep, yeah? Um, so to summarize my, my point, I, I think we have to be careful and we understand in a, in a certain way together, I mean, the same way. Uh, we have to be careful that uh, we do not focus and stay on the hydrocarbons for the area. And uh, uh, as a second step, how we will export to starving uh, other parts of, of, of the continent of Europe. Uh, it is important that um, uh, there is um, success so that the people who live uh, around the Southeast Mediterranean they have access to the wealth. But the wealth, it is not only hydrocarbons. And uh, as, as we said, the things are going so fast that um, uh, the hydrocarbons issue, I think, uh, in the Southeast Mediterranean, although I spent my life uh, in the oil and gas industry, I don't think that it is the critical one. Uh, it is more important to focus on uh, other um, sources of energy also. And uh, uh, we have to realize that the reserves that we may have in Southeast Mediterranean are not enormous. If you compare that with what we have uh, in, uh, in the world, uh, I can give you examples for some countries like the uh, US with uh, uh, 10,000 BCM for, uh, for uh, the LNG, uh, I mean for the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the shale gas. Uh, I can give you the example of uh, Russia that is uh, 48,000 BCM. Uh, the example of Indonesia, that uh, it will be a new uh, player. Uh, we have Qatar, we have Iran. Uh, the uh, quantities of, uh, of gas uh, are enormous. And uh, the time it takes uh, to develop uh, a lot of new stuff, a lot of new uh, reservoirs in, um, in the Southeast Mediterranean, it will bring us to uh, 27, maybe 28. You know very well, or maybe you don't know, but. Uh, uh, in the last, uh, the last uh, year or maybe a couple of years, uh, uh, Egypt uh, production declines. And uh, there are a lot of uh, gas pipelines that are not empty, but there is a lot of av availability. And uh, it is very difficult to go and say to the industry, not the politicians, uh, you know, uh, let's build another pipeline. The industry will say, but there is no need because I have a sufficient place to put gas on the pipelines that we have today. So all of these issues and the time it takes uh, are issues where we have to be careful uh, from the political side in the uh, side and, and for, uh, from the uh, economics that, uh, that the, the region wants to play. Uh, it is not only hydrocarbons. And believe me, uh, I'm saying that because I come from this area, I mean, almost my entire life. What he says, the EastMed gas reserves are only 2% of global gas reserves. So nobody cares, basically, apart from us. But not even the center of the world. Of course, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, what keeps me awake, it's um, unfortunately the fact that when we talk about, um, you know, the ISMAT issue, regional cooperation and all that, we uh, very easily disregard uh, Turkish Cypriots. So Turkish Cypriots are not seen uh, as a political actor, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, such issues. Uh, I'm not talking about... TRNC, I'm talking about the Turkish Cypriot community who would say yes or no in a future referendum and uh, who would become uh, co partners uh, of a future, you know, federation. So, uh, this is, I think, uh, a very major issue, and we need to take this also into consideration. It's not only Turkey which is excluded, but also the Turkish Cypriot community as a political uh, community, I would like to stress. So I think, um, you know, inclusivity, <laughs> as uh, we have it in the panel's uh, name, is really important. And uh, it's um, very critical that uh, Turkish Cypriots are included uh, in any, you know, uh, future potential scheme while talking about the ISMAT uh, energy collaboration and all that. Thank you.
around the world, so much conflict is being talked about. I think the biggest conflict and confrontation will come between US and China, no matter what we say. What's happening now in Ukraine by Russia, occupation of Ukraine by Russia, I think is nothing compared to what will happen in the future. We already have the trade wars, technology wars, currency warfare, um, biological warfare, what we have. But there is a bigger conflict coming up. So uh, I don't want to be a doomsday scenario right here, but that's the reality. I just came back from China, so I understand their mindset and I know how the US is thinking about China as well. The politics, unfortunately, dominate energy. Before, we used to say it's economy stupid, but now geopolitics has become more important than economics. <clears throat> and geopoliticians, diplomats, intelligence guys, and military strategists, they often ignore the commercial realities that we are more interested in, because I've been as a diplomat, also now in the commercial world, and the realities not match each other. We had this Nabucco pipeline project, bringing Caspian gas to Europe. 10 years we discussed, nothing happened. Eastmet pipeline project, lots of discussion, talk, nothing happened. So unless you have the commercial realities, financing funding behind it, all these projects are pipe dreams. I think we have to understand that first, because whatever politicians, diplomats are talking sometimes, are nonsense. So IOC is especially investing in ISMAT, be in Cyprus, uh, Israel, or Egypt. They are looking into commercial realities and how to mitigate the risks. There are huge political risks, unfortunately. If I'm the executive who's going to make the final investment decision, I will really hesitate. And uh, therefore, I think we have to give comfort to investors who are going to put all their efforts behind these projects. Right now, they don't have it. I think they don't sleep at all, looking at the uh, risks and uh, challenges. I think in Turkey now, there is a change of mind, which I hope will be more lasting. Because the new foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, I know him in person very well. So coming from the intelligence world as well, he is a sort of give and take negotiator. You know, hard realities of, this is also the way European Union works among all 28 countries, you have to give and take. I think since he's so powerful now politically, also influential with the President Erdogan, uh, he's someone with whom business can be done on the basis of give and take. Perhaps this is an opportunity for bringing Turkey constructively into the picture, rather than excluding not only Turkey, but also Turkish Cyprus, as uh, Ipek mentioned. I think there is a window of opportunity here. I don't know how long it's going to last because this region is so unstable. Political leadership change from one day to another. And then you have a crisis and all what you have built could be shattered. So he says, okay, yeah, I finish here. Okay. I listen, you know, I'm a good boy. Our moderators. Mickey, Shabbat Shalom for me as well. And uh, happy, <laughs> happy Shukot. Uh, so. Final word to you with the same question. What keeps you up at night and what kind of pill do you take, uh, positive narrative-wise, to go to sleep? And keep it short because you have to do a Shukot dinner and we need to finish the panel now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I sleep not bad, to be honest, Harry. Maybe because I'm less pessimistic than, uh, let's say, many of us. And I will be very much, of course, brief. I'm less pessimistic. And I focus very much on politicians. I know they are not very much popular. And uh, uh, because of the Israeli-Lebanese maritime agreement, I think that this agreement has proved that something it, it is possible to go ahead if there are, uh, let's say, politicians who are, who are able, I would say, to explore or to understand that there are very uh, uh, exceptional, I would say, positively circumstances first. Uh, maybe I will emphasize two lessons of this agreement, and uh, and uh, because it can be relevant, let's say, to more than that. A, both sides have identified energy as a mutual interest in order to go ahead. Now, put aside how much we are small or big; it is not it is not uh, It's not important. Nobody is why is going to be, let's say, a big player in the uh, energy world, uh, let's say, uh, business. 
Number two, both sides were able to overcome the issue of recognition and by that to reach an agreement. Now, I, I don't want to, to be too optimistic about the result of drilling, but the fact is there is an agreement between Lebanon and Israel. The, the, the least, I would say, players that we would think that they may reach an agreement. One final statement, uh, sorry, sentence. Uh, uh, put, uh, uh, pay attention to the Gaza Marine field, the Palestinian uh, field. I'm not saying that is, it is going to go ahead, but there is a talk that, based on these lessons of the Israeli Lebanese agreement, maybe, okay, there is a possibility to go ahead with this present Israeli government, which I'm not going to elaborate very much on that. Thank, thank you very much and uh, happy holidays to all of us. Thank you, Michael. Harry, do we have time to take any questions at all? Zero time? Oh my God. Okay, you know, just I thought, I think, okay, do you want to wrap up? Because between, you know, Charles, Yanis, Ipek, and Mehmet, and you and I, and Ambassador, you know, just uh, we should find, come up with a solution to all the problems that, you know, just the region is having. So please wrap up. Thank so, you, <laughs> by the way. Thank you all. Thank you, Daphne. And, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what a wrap-up would be, but I am sure that this discussion has helped. And so, in a sense, uh, applaud to, to um, holding this discussion. Thank you to the Cyprus Forum for hosting us. Uh, thank you to, uh, to our colleagues at Atlantic Council and PRIO for uh, making this happen. Um, we really think that um, the, um, the, the public debate, especially in Cyprus, that is uh, either not taking place or sometimes is uh, very fragmented, is extremely important. And hence, uh, we think that this, this kind of initiatives um, further the, um, the, um, uh, the discussion in ways that we can think uh, positively. And that's what we take away. Thanks again. Thank you to all of you for being here. And uh, a happy Cyprus Forum for the next couple of days.